Joining us today, Larry Holmes, supervising producer of live tournaments for the Golf Channel. Larry is passionate about the V Foundation's vision for victory over cancer. And today, he is here to share a cancer journey from the caregiver's perspective. He's going to have great insights. We're looking forward to it. Larry, thanks for joining us today. We really appreciate it. John, it's an honor to be here, and I appreciate the opportunity to, to speak with you. Yeah, we're, we're thankful that you're sharing your story today from a perspective we don't always get to talk about, the caregiver's perspective. You lost your wife, Sarah, to uterine cancer last year. You were her caregiver for 21 months. How did she inspire you during her cancer journey that, that you really both took on? John, I think the biggest word that comes to mind once you know we found out Sarah had stage four uterine cancer was Sarah's attitude. You know, there wasn't a history of cancer in Sarah's family. So the obvious question that would come to her mind was why me? And, um, you know, within the first few hours and few days of trying to understand it and, and dive into the cancer world within a week, you know, we met with her oncologist and his great team and um, we started chemo and you know, cancer vocabulary is just a whole other thing that you that is foreign to you, right? I mean, the words and 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 the drugs and and all of this. You know, you're trying to understand and you're trying to figure out how this all relates to everything. And um, but you know, Sarah had a beautiful smile and she always stayed positive. Um, and she did, you know, she did want to tackle this as as best she can. She had a strong faith, which definitely helped um, and was a very big comfort to her. Um, but, you know, it. Um, I would say her attitude was the most inspirational thing. Mm -hmm. You know, she kept doing things in life that, you know, she, she wanted to do, visit friends, go out for dinner or cook dinner or whatever for, for people. And she tried to do that as much as, as her body would, would let her. Um, and then obviously COVID, you know, was a whole other factor um, because she was diagnosed in October of 2019. And then, you know, March of 2020, the world shut down and, and she was dealing with cancer uh, during COVID. So that was a whole other chapter. Talk a little bit about that, that curveball of COVID and what you both had to face then. To your point, Sarah's trying to live her life as, as best she can and keep things uh, moving forward. COVID hits, what was that adjustment like and, and that unexpected part of the path? Yeah, yeah. So, um, like I said, she was diagnosed in October of 2019. And in February of 2020, um, she was in the hospital for three weeks. Um, she took a bad turn. And it, it was, uh, we had found out that, you know, it, it might take her life. Um, we were told, you know, a few weeks to a month possibly. Um, and that was right before COVID hit. And um, luckily, through being able to get immunotherapy in the hospital room, which wasn't always allowed at, at this hospital, um, instead of going, checking out and going to the cancer building, literally right next door to the hospital, but being able to get immunotherapy while she was in the hospital saved her life. And we thank our doctor, our oncologist for that because he really fought for her to get that. So when she got out of the hospital at the end of February, came home, um, COVID hit. And listen, COVID obviously has affected everybody in, in one way. And it's taken, unfortunately, it's taken the lives of so many people. But in a way, COVID was a blessing to Sarah and I because the world shut down I, I was able to work from home and be her caregiver 24 seven. And, and so I think that was really a special time for her and I, you know, to be together. No one really else could come visit or get on a plane and, and come see her. Some of, of our Orlando friends, you know, would drop off food and, and, and stuff like that. But it, it was really uh, hard in that way. And I, I definitely had to make sure I didn't get COVID because what happens if I got COVID, gave it to her, and now in addition to cancer, she has COVID. So we were really, really careful. Um, but COVID definitely played a, a huge role um, 
but in a way, a really kind of neat role for Sarah and I to be able to spend so much time together. Yeah, it's a great way to look at it. You were able to have one-on-one -on -one time that due to your busy lives, you probably haven't had much of a chance to do outside of vacations or something like that. Exactly. You know? Exactly. Yeah. Obviously, you know, when you work at a place like the Golf Channel, that that's a family in and of itself as well. How, how did she inspire the Golf Channel family? Yeah, no, she she definitely did. And, and it is really a family. And we're blessed to be part of that Golf Channel NBC Sports family. Um, you know, it's funny. I I was freelancing at the time for Golf Channel. Um, and when I got my schedule for one year, I saw that I was going to be on the road for 13 straight weeks covering tournaments. And I said, this, I, I said to them, there's no way I can do this and, and keep a, a, a wife happy and, and our marriage, you know, intact. And I go, is there any way Sarah can join the Golf Channel as a production assistant, you know, on, on some of those tournaments that I'm at? I'll teach her everything she needs to know. And there were three tournaments uh, in, a, in a row um, that I was covering that they said, yeah, Sarah could work because we need a production assistant uh, on those shows. So that's how her Golf Channel world started. And, you know, the first week, you know, I taught her as much as I could, introduced her to everybody. And, and, and by the second week, it was like, Larry, I got it. Get away. You know, I'll, I'll, take, I'll take this. And, you know, to know Sarah was she loved being with people. The, you know, she loved talking to people, listening to people, spending time with people. And she quickly, you know, uh, had a great base of, of friends from, from Golf Channel. And um, I, would, I would go into the compound and people would be, and if, if Sarah wasn't on that show, the first question I'd get is, why isn't Sarah on this show? You know, we, we don't really want to be around you. We'd rather, you know, see Sarah. So um, she quickly established herself, not only doing a good job as a production assistant, but at, and it built so many great friendships um, that helped us truly out during her cancer uh, journey as well. But I think one of the, the, the greatest stories of, of her Golf Channel time was she loved working um, the drive, chip, and putt event at Augusta National, which is the Sunday before the Masters. And we at Golf Channel were fortunate enough to um, produce and uh, air that show. And Sarah was a production assistant on that show, I think, for every one of them. And in, in 2020, the tw excuse me, 2021, you know, she couldn't work anymore. But she, she's like, I'm going to work drive, chip, and putt. You know, that was her goal. And to her credit, you know, she worked it and she loved working um, with Mike Tirico and Peter Jacobson in the booth and, and the other announcers and the production and technical team. And just seeing these kids who get to experience Augusta National, right, and, and, their, and their parents and driving down Magnolia Lane and hitting these great shots. And, and, and that was her favorite tournament she ever worked at Golf Channel. And I give her so much credit for, you know, having the willpower to, to get to Augusta. And a lot of people didn't recognize her because obviously she went bald during chemo and her hair, she used to have long hair before, um, you know, cancer and, and it had grown a few inches, but nobody at first recognized her, which was kind of, you know, fun and we could laugh at. But, you know, I really um, give her credit for for getting down to Augusta, Georgia. And that was her first and only show of 2021 20, because she passed away then in July of, of that year. So that moment, uh, I imagine, is one of the high points of, of the journey. And the fact that she was able to overcome so much to be at Augusta for that event that she loved. What was the toughest part of the journey? You know, I think the toughest part of, of of seeing your loved one have cancer is that you know you're not in control uh cancer is in is in control and and there's so much unknown you know one one scan results could be really good and then you know the next scan could show more tumors and and so you really just don't know um and 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 just seeing your loved one um you know suffer it, it it's hard right um and there's nothing you can do uh, 
because of that. And, and, and so I think that was, that's really hard. As I said, I think, uh, I think another tough part of, of the journey was, as I mentioned, she almost passed away in, in, in February of 2020. And her dad was really sick back home in, in Minneapolis. And she knew she wouldn't be able to say, see her father before he passed away because of cancer and because of COVID and travel restrictions. Um, you know, it was hard for, for me to call her mom and say, you better come down here to Orlando. And if you want to say goodbye, you know, to your daughter, um, that's, that's really tough, you know, to have those conversations with family and friends to let them know, um, at that point, you know, she might not be around much longer. So I think those things, um, are really, really tough. Um, and, and, you know, just hearing sometimes she would, she would wake up in the morning and for the first few seconds, sometimes she would think, you know, I don't have cancer. It wouldn't be the first thing that popped into her mind, you know, but then the reality of having cancer, um, you know, would, would, would jump in and, and, and just things like that, you know, are really, really tough on the patient. Um, and she was, you know, Sarah was one who, when we would go to see her, her doctors, she really didn't want to know the bad stuff. Um, we would meet with the doctors and then she would leave and then I would find out really the, everything, you know, and, you know, she just said, Hey, if my time is up, let me know. And let's, let's go to Hawaii. <laughs> let's travel as much as we can and, and have fun. Um, but, you know, it was hard, hard for me as, as a, one of the hard parts of being a caregiver is kind of balancing what I know and what she doesn't want to know. Right. And, and, and so I think that was a little bit uh, tough from my perspective of the journey, but you know, the toughest part is just seeing your loved one um, go through this and having these chemicals in them and the pain and the suffering and, and the unknown. You shared a lot there about what you both had to handle and from the tough talks you had to have with her parents to, to your point, hearing about all the news, the good and the bad, and trying to digest what to relay back. There's, there's a lot on your plate as a caregiver of a loved one, it, you know, someone who's as close to you as anyone in, in your life. Mm -hmm. What advice what, what would you have for another caregiver who right now might, might be going through the same situation that, that you experienced? Yeah. You know, I'll, I'll preface this as, as uh, my answer uh, before I give my answer is saying the, the patient has it the toughest, no doubt, right? They have cancer. They've got chemo and immunotherapy and all these other things in their body. And, uh, you know, I will always say that Sarah had the toughest part. But being a caregiver was probably the hardest job I ever had, but it was probably the most fulfilling job I ever had because I got to take care of Sarah. Um, and that's something I'll, I'll, I'll never forget. Um, you know, in addition to your nine to five job, you know, at the golf channel, um, you know, you're the one who's picking up prescriptions. You're the one who's talking with the, the uh, doctor's office and, and, scheduling the next appointments and then taking your loved one to those appointments and waiting in the waiting room. Um, you're the one who's going to the grocery store. You're the one who's going, you know, cooking three, four meals a day. My God, my cooking is, <laughs> I definitely <laughs> learned how to cook. And I was as sweet as Sarah was, she, she ate the food I gave her, but you know, you're the one doing the laundry, you know, making the bed, doing the bills, like, it just keeps adding on, you know, as the caregiver. And um, the one, as much as you don't mind doing that for your loved one, obviously, the one regret I had was because I had my nine to five job and then the job as the caregiver, the one thing I regret is I didn't sometimes always just spend time listening to Sarah and asking her questions about how's it going? What's really going on in your head? What are your thoughts and fears and anxieties? Um, you know, we did talk, but I wish 
we had talked more. I wish I had said, you know what, forget the laundry tonight. I'm going to spend time with Sarah and just really talk. And so, you know, I, I would say don't let all these tasks consume your life. You know, make sure you, you, you know, you talk with your loved one about what they're going through. Um, and I think the other thing that I think we all can relate to, whether you have a loved one who's going through some type of uh, sickness. Um, but one thing we did, and hopefully other people do, but I, I think I've talked to a lot of friends who are experiencing this with parents who are, you know, losing, losing their parents is make sure, and it seems so obvious, but make sure you know your loved one's usernames and passwords to, you know, things like their, their email or their bank accounts or their life insurance policies or, you know, Instagram and Facebook and, and, and even their passcode to their iPhone. Imagine if you couldn't get into your loved one's iPhone because you don't know the four digit code and all the pictures and everything that's on our phones these days. So as simple as that sounds, so many people forget about that. And then all of a sudden your loved one is gone and you have no clue how to access anything that they, they have. And so that's one other tip, um, you know, that I would say, make sure you know all of that information. And that's something that would be totally natural for someone to not even think about with, every, with everything that you're sharing that's on your plate, um, mm -hmm. that, that Sarah was facing. Mm -hmm. It's just something that it's a part of everyday life that wouldn't even cross yeah. most people's minds. Right, right. When it comes to cancer, how important is the team aspect? And it really is a team of doctors, researchers, caregivers, family, friends. You had the challenge of COVID too, where you might not be able to see family and friends as much as um, someone might now here in this post COVID mm -hmm. realm. But how important is that, the, the, the team aspect? Yeah, it, it's huge. Uh, everyone plays such an important role, whether it's a text or a phone call or, you know, sending food to us or blankets. Man, John, if you need a blanket, I've got 15 <laughs> blankets for you. <laughs> you know, you appreciate all the, the love and support and the gifts and everything that people just People have good hearts and they really step up in, in a time of, of need. And, you know, the NBC Golf Channel family was so great to me. Um, that's key to have, you know, um, a family like that who understands what you're going through. Gosh, insurance is so important too. make sure, you know, you have great insurance. Um, but, you know, I, I, you know, my sister, every time. Sarah was in the hospital, whether it was in Orlando or, or when we moved to Connecticut um, to work out of NBC Sports headquarters um, when Golf Channel moved up to Connecticut. My sister would fly in, you know, and stay with me at the hospital, would track down those doctors for further answers or the nurses. Um, and just having that support was huge. I have a friend who's in the pharmaceutical industry and specializes in cancer drugs. And I would call him after every doctor's, you know, report and say, what, what does this mean? You know, can you help me? What are these drugs are, what are these drugs doing? And what does this mean? And, and, you know, just being, having those words spoken in just English, yeah. <laughs> right. And yeah. under, trying to understand this crazy cancer world. And, you know, we had friends, in Orlando, like I said, who would bring over food or take Sarah to to chemo if I couldn't because I had a call for work that I couldn't get out of or, or, or something like that. We had a great team in Orlando when we were there, the doctors and the nurses. I mean, unbelievable work that, you know, we drive by hospitals and if, if you don't have to be in a hospital, you have no clue the unbelievable and the great people who work at a hospital, who dedicate their lives to helping people. And I, and I, it's not only the doctors and the nurses, but the people who bring you your food, uh, the people who clean your room and put new sheets on the bed or, or give you a shower. You know, you, you just have, you don't know the impact 
that that has on a on a patient, right? And and so we were so appreciative of the team of doctors and nurses and staff at all the hospitals. We went to MD Anderson, you know, in in Houston, we, and then once we moved to Connecticut, we we switched to Memorial Sloan Kettering, and the unbelievable doctors there that we had and, and the team there, and you know, we 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 started a text chain of about seven of us called Team Sarah. And it was comprised of <clears throat> my family and and some of Sarah's friends and um, our friends in Orlando and Minneapolis. And, and you know, it, it was updating everybody what was going on because they couldn't get down to us in, during COVID. But it continues on to today, you know, and, and hearing about what's going on in their lives. And, and so you you have to have a team, you know, you have to have a team surrounded by you. And, and, you know, you, you never wish you met some of these people, obviously, but you're sure as hell glad that you did because they are unbelievable people and they should really be honored um, for all the hard work that they do. And, and like you said, get, giving their, their lives. I mean, the hours aren't easy oh. and um, the work is even harder. Yeah. This experience has you becoming an advocate for cancer research. What is it about the V Foundation's mission to fund all-star research, our vision of victory over cancer that appeals to you? You know, I'm definitely in the shallow end of the V Foundation and, and, and uh, you know, doing this podcast, I'm grateful and, and humbled to be able to tell Sarah's story. Um, I totally want to help get rid of cancer, right? I mean, I will do anything, you know, I can um, to, to move this forward and, um, you know, to eliminate cancer, it, it all begins with research and the dollars are so important, you know, for those researchers and for those doctors to try to figure it out, to, you know, experimental trials and, and, and all of that. And, um, you know, I, I read on the, on the website, on your website, there's 100 plus types of cancer and that just blew me away. You know, we might just hear the top 10 big ones, right? But my gosh, a um, hundred plus types of cancer. And so every dollar, um, what I love, every dollar that you give goes to research. And, you know, the goal is to get rid of cancer and I'm all for it. And I will do whatever I can to, to be a part of that in some small, small way. You, you mentioned that every dollar and, and yeah, that a hundred percent giving pledge we're able to do thanks to our partnership with ESPN. And it all started with them. It all started with that yeah. SB speech, of course, a little bit before the SB speech, but then that night you worked at ESPN, uh, you worked with Dick mm -hmm. Vitale. What do you take away from Dick, one, being so public with his journey, but then two, sure, he's dealing with his own cancer journey and he's still committed to raising funds for pediatric cancer research. Yeah. What can you say about Dick Vitale, right? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> he is awesome. Um, <laughs> You know, I, I would say there's no one more passionate um, about this than Dick Vitale. And, you know, when I was at ESPN, the goal was to work hard enough to get on a Dick Vitale college basketball game. And I was lucky enough, and I, I you know, I think it was 93 in, in the 94 college basketball season, to be on most of his games as a graphics associate producer. And, you know, just going to the practices and, and, you know, him talking to the players and coaching them and, and, and then dinner with Dick Vitale, like how cool was that, right? As a, as a young kid out of college. Um, but then fast forward, you know, to what he is doing with pediatric cancer and his, his gala in Florida mm -hmm. and the amount of money that he has raised for that and, you know, his, you know, his SB speech a few, a few months ago and, and talking about these kids that he's met and he's had to go to funerals and like, how hard is that, you know, to, 
to experience that. But yet, you know, there was no one more passionate about trying to get rid of this and, and, and him doing everything he can in his power. And I follow him on social media and uh, <laughs> he's pretty you know, active, you know, <laughs> he is active and, and you love that. And, and, you know, he has time for everybody. You know, he, he stops, takes pictures, signs autographs, talks to them. Not too many people would always do that right in his position. And that's something I always thought was really, really special, you know, about him. But, um, you know, the, to your point, the way he he put out his cancer journey on social media was really inspirational and definitely had to touch so many people um, and so glad that he is recovering well from it. And uh, Lord knows he's he's got more years in him and, uh, you know, we will see him raise more money and and do everything he can to help cure cancer. He said at his gala this year, he wants to get to 100, 100 years old. So we'll see if anyone can do it. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I totally agree. <laughs> Tell us about your role at the Golf Channel. Uh, you know, there's golf has had the Tiger era. It's had the Jack Nicholas era. I feel like this era, though, it, it's unlike anything we've seen uh, with the PGA Tour. Now live PGA elevating events and, and really, you know, evolving how it's approaching its whole operation. What's it like to be a part of the golf world right now as part of your role at the Golf Channel? Yeah, it's definitely interesting. Golf is uh, in the papers, uh, <laughs> in social media every day, uh, good or bad, right? Um, listen, I think, you know, I, I think it's an interesting time in the golf world, to your point. Um, Liv has come out and, and, and they have these tournaments and, and the PGA has responded. Um, and... To your point, there's these elevated now tournaments. There'll be 13 next year. And then you add on the four majors and then the three other events that, you know, the players are have to go to. So you're going to see 20 plus tournaments where all the superstars in the PGA Tour will be at. And that's pretty special because we didn't see that always in the past. You know, we'd always see them at the majors and at the players. And, and, and so I think that is a really, really cool thing. You know, as far as live, um, just because I work in the golf channel, I'll, <laughs> right. I'll, 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 I'll stay clear of that for a little bit. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I have my thoughts. Um, but listen, I mean, we, the golf world is reacting because of live in some positive ways. So I'll, I'll, I'll give him that. Um, but yeah, it definitely is an interesting time. Hopefully, um, you know, this war will be settled. But in the meantime, I think next year will be some really exciting golf with these now 20 elevated events to see your favorite players competing against each other. Obviously for a lot of money, but but I think the competition part of it will be really, really special to see and to, to, to be able to telecast. For sure. And, and it'll be interesting to see, you know, if the majors stay out of it or if they... Um, yeah, we'll find out at Augusta. <laughs> exactly, we'll find out at Augusta, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, how has coverage of live tournaments changed over the past 10 years? And maybe even beyond that, but... Yeah, sure. I mean, I think the first thing is the amount of hours now that our, that golf is, is televised. Obviously, Golf Channel is 24-7 of golf, but... But, you know, weekend golf on the networks, you know, is, is there's expanded hours and and at the majors, you know, you now have featured holes coverage and featured group coverage um, at a, at at Augusta. You have Amen Corner coverage. And, and you know, I, I know when we televise at NBC, the you know, the uh, U.S. Open and, and the Open Championship and Ryder Cup and President's Cup and some of the others, it's it's first tee to last putt every day, right? You never used to see that before. So just the amount of coverage and access that is out there to the viewer is, is unbelievable. And, and, and even on the PGA tour every weekend, you, you have featured group coverage. And, and so it's out there, right? Um, so the amount of hours I think is one thing. Um, 
and then you know technology obviously has has in every sport uh has has really grown um tracer drones super slow-mo cameras um you know it it's it, it's all it's all out there and and i think COVID obviously um really brought technology to the forefront um on how we produce golf and and other sports you know we can we can produce it now from our our headquarters and not always have to be out you know at the tournament or at the game or at the horse race you know at the track so i, I think um i think technology will continue to advance and we you know we get we hear from companies all the time about new technology that they're working on and how can they implement that into to golf. Um, so I think it's an exciting time, no doubt. Um, and I think um, there's just so many ways you can um, soak up golf, whether it's on your phone or iPad or, or television. For sure. I love, um, especially during the majors, having that second screen de dedicated to those yeah. featured holes, like mm -hmm. you said, and, and, and watching. Yep. and. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it wasn't always where you could watch the first group at 8 a.m. on a Thursday in round one, and now exactly you can do that. We ask all of our guests this: What does victory over cancer mean to you? Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like it means a couple things. Um, I would say the first thing is victory over cancer means that you don't see a loved one pass away, you know, uh, and have to fight through cancer and all that 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 entails, and and the hardships. Um, so I would say that would be one thing to, to eliminate that. How, how awesome would that be? Right. Um, but I think, I think victory winning means, you know, what Jim Valvano said in his speech, those seven words, don't give up, don't give up, don't ever give up. And, you know, if you don't give up, you'll, you'll have victory, you'll win. And I think what the V Foundation is doing is, is incredible. And they're implying, you know, they're, they're, they're getting those words uh, out, out there and, and doing it. And so um, I think that kind of, to me, is what victory over cancer means. Yeah. Plow forward. Right, right. Don't give up, continue to move forward. Uh, we'll, we'll end with, with where we started and, and talking about Sarah and would love to know how she continues to inspire you today. Yeah, you know, Sarah's with me 24-7. I think about her all the time, right? Um, I think just because she has passed doesn't mean that I stop talking about her or I want other people to stop talking about her. Um, her spirit lives with me 24-7. So um, I think... Um, you know, the way she lived her life, life I, I try to uh, implement some of that in, in, into my life. And um, I think she would want me to get involved in, in, in charities and, and organizations like the V Foundation, you know, so others don't have to go through what she went through. Um, so I think, I, I think um, she would, um, want you know I, I i'm i guess i'm trying to live out her hopes and dreams too right um and continue those on and, and achieve some of the things that she wanted to, to achieve in life as well um but i think now my main goal is is you know her spirit is is with me and let's do something to get rid of cancer and and, and help help others who need the help and so that's that's my goal how i do it I, I, I don't know. This is a start, obviously, just, you know, again, honored to be able to to share her story. But um, I, I want to get my hands and feet dirty. Believe me. Well, we appreciate you. We appreciate you sharing your story. Um, and from the caregiver's perspective, I think it, it is it's so important and it will inspire others. And um, look forward to watching many of, of your broadcasts coming up. As you said, it'll be a busy year with, with golf. Thank you. And, um, Thank you, Larry. We appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you to the V Foundation. You guys are incredible. And uh, again, hope to to help out in any way uh, I can. We'll see you at the Vital Gala maybe in, uh, in, there you in, go. in April. Yeah. Right? I'm happy to set up tables and wash dishes. <laughs> there I'll do we whatever go. I can. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs>